thank you for joining us for this Ask Me Anything panel discussion in the HC, first HCA Africa Symposium. Um, we're very fortunate to have um, some really great panelists. Um, one of our panelists, unfortunately, has some technical details, but will be joining us in a little bit. But we have um, one of the co-leads of the HCA, Avi Vergev, and we have Man Zawati, also who's been working a lot with the HCA on ethics issues. And Avi would like to say a few words uh, to everybody attending this session. Avi? Thanks, Musa, and thanks for having me here. Um, I'm really delighted to be here in spirit. I wish this were an in-person meeting, but I hope the world will, will get back to those soon. Um, this meeting is very important for us. It's, uh, it comes on the heels, I think, of a lot of work that has been done. But at the end of the day, HCA will only be successful if it is a global effort that involves scientists from across the world and represents humans from across the world. And in that, I don't just mean genetic diversity, but also geographic diversity, where people actually live. Because of course, our cells represent all of our experiences, both our genetic legacy, as well as just our um, experiential uh, variation. Um, this is a journey that um, in typical HCA tradition can only be done by the community coming together. HCA is not a top-down consortium. There is nothing that we do that um, comes from somebody sitting in a room making a decision and everyone else has to follow or execute. It's not a closed club. You don't need a membership card in order to enter. You can become an, a member as long as you uh, ascribe to um, HCA's values. So it's a grassroots organization. And for organizations like this, anything that HCA wants to do is down to everyone deciding that they want to do it together. There have to be people who want to do that. And so for um, um, global representation, it means that the world of science has to participate. And um, our approach to that has always been to try and generate the grassroots enthusiasm with people where they are at the work, at the work that they do and in the communities where they work and the communities that they serve. And so this is really our opening for this. Um, we need to be guided and taught as much as we would love to contribute and in that become one rather than uh, separate communities. Very excited for the conversation. We dubbed it as an ask me anything with the idea that, well, it's ask us anything, technically speaking, with the idea that Anyone can ask any question that they want, but we would just as much love to hear the, as we would love to answer. It's a complete uh, two-way street. Um, we'd love to hear what we can do better and more, um, what people on the ground want to see happening, and what are the ways in which everyone can partner and collaborate to achieve uh, the greater goal of having a reference map of all human cells. And I'll turn it back to Musa. Thank you so much, Aviv. Thanks for your really generous comments. Um, we have an opportunity, before, we have a couple of questions that are being typed right now, but uh, Man, do you have any comments so far on what you've seen over the last couple of days with the HCA Africa Symposium? And you gave a really great presentation yesterday. So um, what are your thoughts so far? Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think um, th this is a great event and uh, a real opportunity for not just networking, even though we're doing this virtually for, for many of us, but also in terms of creating bridges and dialogue uh, between between experts and and uh, communities, uh, plural. Um, you know, there is a research community, but there are other communities as well that directly benefit from the research that uh, that is being done. And I, I really think that um, the diversity as well, not of just the attendance, but also of the topics that are presented really represents the comprehensiveness of this um, very important project. So this is really exciting. Um, and I think uh, this will establish really kind of a foundation for uh, such future uh, initiatives, uh, um, you know, in the in the future. Um, you know, the, the world of ethics and policy and, and legal issues, as, as was presented yesterday, is sometimes seen as a, uh, 
you know, sometimes seen as a, as a hurdle or as a challenge, but it's really there to be a facilitator uh, to ensure that we think in, you know, and, and anticipate potential uh, issues that may arise and try to work out solutions so that um, we can ensure, you know, uh, that that the, the benefit that will come out of these research projects is fair and and timely. So um, uh, congratulations to to everyone uh, that is being involved and, and thank you very much for the audience to, uh, for being here. Thanks a lot for your comments. Um, so since this is asking anything, there was a there was a really nice uh, panel discussion that we had from some leading African genomics researchers and biomaticians. I guess one of the questions I asked them was um, how they saw themselves fitting into the current roadmap of the HCA, and I think one of the best answers uh, I got to that question was really for people in Africa to set the agenda on how they would use this future of single cell research to kind of set their own agendas and benefit to them. And I know um, we're coming up on the first draft of the Human Cell Atlas. And I'm just curious, Aviv, for your thoughts on how, as you say, incorporating geographic and genetic diversity into the HCA and how um, that will work itself with, you know, the agenda that's being set really by African researchers and probably in other parts of the world, like Latin America and Southeast Asia around us. So first of all, this really resonates with me. There isn't, a, there isn't any primacy to any part of the Atlas. And that was, I think, from conception, that this is an open resource. And so whoever wants to contribute, contributes on their own terms. There are some, you know, the terms have to be ethical, for example, but they do not have to adhere to some pre-specified set of conditions set up by somebody else. And that is the work that this has actually played out with other communities as well. Musa, you've just uh, related to Latin America. I will also highlight Asia another area um, where there is a regional effort. And this regional effort follows the key, um, the key areas of interest and commitment and passion of those who build the Atlas in Asia. And there is no issue with that for HCA. Um, one of the things that is interesting about how we're, we've built the Atlas um, from the beginning and continuing now is that we've always left room for the individual initiative rather than having everyone come together and say, this is exactly how it's going to be collected. And now, you know, group A will have to fulfill this task and group B will have to fulfill this task and group C will fulfill a different task. Maybe because of the magnitude of the Atlas itself, maybe because these are just different times than in the history of some genomic consortia in the past, maybe because the methodology is much more broadly accessible and HCA continues and should continue making efforts to make sure methods are accessible. Maybe for other reasons, that's not how we proceeded. We proceeded with the idea, this is our North Star, we all want to have an atlas and we're each going to build a road in that direction. Now the effort to build a roadmap, by the way, for each of what we call the biological networks, each of the organs or systems that together comprise the human body is again an open effort. And so scientists can choose to do it in a certain way and they can choose to do it in a different way. And then the third piece that I think is particularly important is that we're putting a lot of effort into the computational integration in ways in which we can take data that might have been collected either by different lab methods or in different settings or based on different experimental design principles and make sure that it all can be connected together, either as part of the underlying reference or in ways that you can map data into the reference in order to glean new biological insights. My, my perspective on this, and I think HCAs more generally is, the scientists in Africa should say what should be done by them. No one else should say it. But the general community should be there to provide collaboration, advice, support, open arms. And that this plays out in this way, no matter which region or location you're at. I could substitute the word Africa by Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe. The roles shift around, 
but everyone is on a uh, level playing field. I think that's our, our ultimate goal. And in this way, we will build the best, best Atlas. We have a question or two from the audience. I'm going to start with the latest one. Um, this is from Dorit Hochman. Um, Dorit is a researcher at the University of Cape Town. I think the ability to pool samples for single cell analysis may go a long way towards helping African researchers to overcome the cost of using expensive platforms like the 10X Genomics platform. Can you comment on how much the HCA community is using sample pooling approaches and whether they are approaches that seem to perform best? Um, we have our last panelist, Maz Hanifa, has just joined us. Maz, I'm going to spring this question and comment on you. Uh, hi, everyone. I really apologize about the slight delay in uh, joining, and it's a great pleasure to be here, to be really privileged and honored. Um, in terms of pooling samples, this has been done very extensively, um, particularly, uh, I think a great example is in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where, you know, we've analyzed many any more donors than we have in the past and largely thanks to pooling samples and that can be done in several ways either you know the samples have their individual barcode tagging or by using um, uh, polymorphism to deconvolute the samples from a genetic uh, basis uh, that does go a long way but i think something to bear in mind is that um, you know the cost of these things are going to generally uh, go lower in the next few years and I think this will you know definitely facilitate a lot more research and there are going to be newer technologies that will allow you know many more you know cells to be analyzed at a lower cost um, so I think yes we are at that kind of like uh, um, position where we can do sample poolings cost going down but I think it will be a lot better you know very rapidly in the next few years the cost is dramatically dropped uh, in many ways, I mean, we were analyzing hundreds to thousands of cells, and now we're going at, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of cells. And there are many other platforms, alternative to 10x genomics as well, that are much more cost effective. That's the SQL method. That's the SciSeq method. Um, you know, they are there out there in the community. I will uh, add uh, maybe two things um, that could be useful for people to bear in mind. The first is that for pooling samples, you usually have to collect a set of samples together. So in the immune system, this was always the easiest because you can collect the samples frozen and yet still pull them for single cell analysis. And that's where we saw at first pooling happen. But now with single nucleus sequencing, you can actually collect a whole uh, set of frozen samples and then process them together from the very first step and demultiplex them later. And there's methods like that that are now being published and uh, deployed successfully. And I expect those to be quite uh, useful um, into the future. And in addition, we're starting to see methods that are actually working on samples that were pre preserved like FFPEs, which is an even easier to apply a preservation method and where you can even go to archived samples, either frozen or FFPEs and do these kinds of analyses. And so that would be one area where pooling would, I think, be applied more uh, extensively. The other point that I'll make uh, following uh, uh, Maz's point that the single cell or nucleus processing methods themselves have become much more scaled and that there are approaches like split pool based approaches and SQL, which are cheaper and not necessarily require a commercial partner. So that's one benefit. And the other is that sequencing costs have been substantial, but, uh, but there is actually new um, um, new sequencing technologies that are starting to emerge that might make sequencing substantially cheaper. And increasingly, sequencing actually dominates the cost of the experiment. So it is very nice to see that happen. And then finally, computational costs are also non-trivial in actually analyzing these kinds of volumes of data. And this is where we hope that things like the data coordination platform and the processing uh, activities that it can provide for raw data would actually be another way in which the global community can help, you know, people can help each other in um, doing uh, scalable experiments um, at a reasonable cost. Just on that last point on the DCP or the data coordination platform, uh, Aviv, this is to your earlier remarks. Wouldn't it be quite important to try to get deeper integration of basically bioinformaticians and scientists in Africa who are generating single cell data into the DCP just so that, you know, as, as you rightly mentioned, there's sort of a harmonization of techniques and methods 
um, with you know as 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 the HCA community enlarges into different parts of the world. So there are two things that are underway that I think would be particularly important for what you've just said. The first is that the DCP itself is working very actively on controlled access. Um, um, uh, or the position of controlled access data, which often is required in order to protect, um, to comply with genetic privacy laws. And I can imagine um, that, I cannot just imagine, I would say we should um, maybe dedicate a particular session or workshop during we, which is just focused on, you know, DCP engagement with African uh, bioinformaticians and computational biologists so that there is a clear understanding of what the DCP can do to support, the ways in which the DCP wranglers can help scientists, which they do all across the world, can help scientists actually upload their data to the DCP, the kinds of metadata that one would want to, um, uh, one would want to collect um, in order to make for a successful deposition and what are what could be the unique uh, um, access controls that are required in order to comply with local laws and regulations and ethics. The second piece that I think is very important is that HCA is now pivoting through its analysis working group and others um, into uh, plans for data integration. So for ways of taking not just here's a study that's been processed and here's a study that's been analyzed, but actually to bring across multiple studies together. And the timing is actually perfect now for this level of engagement with uh, bioinformatics and computational scientists in Africa. This is more in the analysis realm rather than the data coordination and deposition realm. And both of these things I think are very timely. Thanks for your answer, Aviv. We have a question from the floor. Um, what HCA activities or role of training and engagement by HCA exists for early career scientists to leverage on in the HCA in research, especially for African trainees. So just to summarize this question, uh, maybe I didn't read it very clearly, but what opportunities are there for um, African trainees, especially early career scientists to, to get trained in this field or in this area of science? Um, we have Alex Shalik who's uh, a member of the HCA Equity Working Group, who's who's just joined the panel, and maybe Alex, you wanna you wanna talk about you know maybe some of the activities that the HCA is engaged in for in terms of trainees that are geared for African scientists. I'm be sure I'm sure I'd be happy to comment briefly, Musa. I think that you know one of the things that we've been trying to do or roaches do training and empowerment. There were some. Uh, discussion in the previous session about um, remote computational workshops and jamborees like the ones that have been running Latin America, which would be fantastic to recreate with a number of individuals in the area. The other thing we've been pushing a lot for that I think is going to be critical, particularly for young trainees, is bi-directional um, exchange. You know, prior to the pandemic, we had spent a good amount of time um, hosting trainees over in our lab in Boston. And I think that um, figuring out ways to do that more broadly to enable, you know, short stints is going to be one of the critical mechanisms that um, we'll have to build up a little bit more systematically across the HCA. But the other thing that, you know, I, I'd love to hear and that I posed in the last session is I'd love to know a little bit more about what have been effective training mechanisms for young trainees um, in the context of H3 Africa or the like. Um, as Christian was bringing up, there's a lot of great work that's been done in the past um, when it continues to happen on the continent. And so we'd love to figure out how to leverage those, how to synergize into them and how to build upon them as opposed to reinventing the wheel. Um, so I don't know if, um, if if um, Christian was able to join this one, or Nikki, I'm looking through the list really quickly, but it would be something where I'd, I'd also love to know what has worked well, and maybe Dominic, you have some examples. Um, but I think of you know on-site roadshows has been discussed, bi-directional training, and then really trying to think about how we can synergize and support some of the ongoing activities, and maybe build in some single cell specific ones uh, that go along with all the uh, work that um, is being done on genomics by H3 Africa and by um, others. Okay, um, last question we have goes to Man, um, and it's a question from Dominic Muzu. Does HEA give help in acquiring or give support towards broad consent for researchers? Sorry to spring that one on you, Man. It's it's fine. No, it's fine. Um, I mean, broad consent has has become right now. I would say the um, 
the, the standard when it comes to uh, large collections of, of data and samples and, and something that will allow it to, um, you know, to, to authorize or, you, or, or give the opportunity for, for uh, the researchers to be able to use uh, these uh, data without having to, you know, initiate what we call also consent fatigue, where there's always reconsenting that's needed. Um, uh, the HCA and, and I think more specifically the ethics uh, a working group has worked on uh, templates uh, um, and core elements um, regarding uh, broad consent or consent that in some ways uh, universally uh, would be accepted. Um, and, and to ensure also interoperability. Uh, so there, these, these resources are, are there and do exist. Um, there, you know, uh, one very important thing to keep in mind as well when it comes to broad consent, that it's not just about consent, it's also about uh, governance. So ensuring that there is also proper governance uh, in place uh, in terms of approval of, of research projects, in terms of um, oversight uh, for access mechanisms uh, to protect participants, but also other than governance, uh, it's ongoing communication with uh, participants, whether it's um, passive or active um, with engagement or with uh, transparency and information being available on who's accessing what and, and from where uh, to allow to allow individuals and, and participants from around the world to know exactly what's happening and be up to date. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, that brings our Ask Me Anything session to an end. I want to thank all our panelists, um, Alex Shalik, Mazanifa, Benzawati, and Aviv Regev for taking the time to participate in this first Africa Symposium of the Human Cell Atlas.